shock the system. Welcome to Dank Discussions with your host, Calican CEO, Maynard Breslow. In each episode, you'll learn from the trailblazers, leaders, entrepreneurs, and influencers in the ever-moving, ever-growing cannabis industry. Hey there, everybody. Welcome to Dank Discussions. Today, we're joined by Meg Sanders. Meg is the CEO of Canna Provisions. Uh, thank you for joining us today, Meg. Thank you for having me. It's a, it's a great to be here and uh, very nice to see you in, in on our Zoom meetings. So yeah, exactly, nice right? Eye contact with a human. Exactly. I love it. And I, I love your energy, obviously, you know, but uh, this is the first time we met and uh, it does definitely add a different dimension, you know, obviously not being a person, but also being able to, to have this time, you know, here on Zoom and, um, you know, we're doing things a little bit differently, obviously, before uh, the pandemic and everything like that. But uh, uh, every, I'm sure you, you will get into this as well, you know, able to make adjustments and uh, keep moving on and sometimes maybe even better than it was before. So I'm um, going to get into that. But yeah, I definitely I'm talking about that because it is really interesting um, what's happening in the cannabis space during this time, for sure. Definitely. And so, you know, we want to talk about, you know, uh, your dispensaries that you have there, um, kind of talking about the customer experience and how I've been able to maintain that in these times, right? But also talking about uh, data that goes behind those decisions that you make um, and talking about cultivation as well that you guys are going on. But I guess, you know, as I always say, um, starting off easy, right? So let our listeners know where you're based out of today. So I am actually coming at you from our cultivation in Sheffield, Massachusetts, which is about 20 minutes away from our dispensary in Lee. Um, And then we have another dispensary in Holyoke, Massachusetts. And so we're a very Western Massachusetts focused company. Very good. Yeah. You know, I had the uh, pleasure, actually, we we started becoming connected as uh, we were uh, taking a weekend there up there in Otis, Massachusetts. And uh, decided to go check out, uh, you know, the local dispensary was going on. And we're really impressed by kind of provisions, you know. So just kind of opened that door and said, hey, you know what? I love what they're doing here. It's kind of different. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a Cali guy, you know. So what's going on in L.A. is completely different from what you guys are going on in terms of how you are uh, maintaining that safety uh, during, um, you know, COVID. But also how you're able to maintain that level of uh, of you know, quality and customer experience as well that I think sometimes um, we're lacking in terms of, um, you know, it's a difficult thing. So everybody kind of adapts in a different way, but I really like the set that you guys had and everything. So obviously want to get into that. Um, but, you know, talk to me a little about, it. before we get into all that, you know, I'd love to hear, Meg, about your background in terms of cannabis. You know, obviously cannabis is, uh, it's a, as we're talking about, right, it's a very difficult industry, a lot of different things going on, a lot of compliance, red tape, everything like that. So you have to really have to be so passionate about what we do. Um, but talk to me about, you know, your background in cannabis and uh, what pushes you to keep doing what you're doing. Well, you know, it's a it's an interesting story. I kind of came into cannabis, not necessarily as um, a traditional consumer at the time. I was actually, I had young kids and um, young school age kids. And I was also the um, president of my son's football booster club and volunteer at my kid's school and, you know, all those kinds of things. So it wasn't necessarily a, a, a big, big time and or a big topic on my radar, except that I was in Colorado. And in 2009, we really saw the green rush just explode, yeah. obviously correlating directly with the coal memo that basically said, if you're operating under a medical uh, regime, then, you know, we're, we're not going to go after you. And everyone took that right to heart and rented up a ton of space, whether it be warehouse or, or store, you know, retail locations, anybody that would have us, we definitely grabbed the uh, opportunity. And for me, um, a friend of mine that I went to college with was getting into the space and I came from a financial compliance background. So I had some compliance experience, which was definitely necessary, Uh um, especially in a fledgling fledgling, um, industry that didn't even have rules and regs on the table yet. I mean, they they had nothing. So um, it, it was a very interesting jump but it was appropriate in that I really hit a limit as far as where I could actually end up in the current situation I was in. And I was at the top, there was no going anywhere else. And um, this was just a great opportunity to, to uh, start in a brand new industry and hopefully um, capture new opportunities as a female 
And that's what I did. And um, started in Colorado with um, multiple dispensaries up and down the Front Range, as well as a um, one acre under uh, one acre indoor cultivation, as well as a 26,000 square foot manufacturing space. So we were truly vertically integrated. That company was mindful, and I had the pleasure of being the CEO there until approximately 2017. Mm -hmm. So that was great, um, which also kind of went through the transition of medical to implementing um, Amendment 64, which the voters approved. And I was super fortunate to be tapped on the shoulder by the governor of Colorado, Governor Hickenlooper at that time, to serve on the Amendment 64 task force. And I was actually the only cannabis business member on the task force, which is so odd when you think about it. Um, there's only one person out of a 14 member task force to address actually how the business needs to operate and what's important and what the pains are in the business. And so I did my best to kind of find my way through it. And, um, but it was, it was a great experience. We did a lot of work very, very quickly. And then adult use kicked off and man, we've never looked back. It just, it was a, just a really great work by a whole bunch of people, including um, the Department of Revenue, including the governor, um, all of our legislators that were behind us. And then the industry who truly had to, um, you know, reinvent themselves again. And it happens so often in this industry when one little regulation just tips the scale in a whole different direction, creating either capital constraints or personnel constraints. I mean, there's just so many things about this industry that are that are really unique. And that is one of them. But that that's kind of what got me going. And then as more and more states came online, um, we had an opportunity to consult. There was a real need for people to get help because oh. otherwise they were going to go through the years and years of pain that we went through. Yeah. And you really hope that the industry keeps evolving and becoming smarter and better and faster and stronger. And that only does that if people with experience are able to help guide others. And so there's a real demand for consulting, which my partner, Eric Williams and I um, decided to focus on pretty much solely in 2017. He had already been focusing on it, but um, I joined the ranks full time and we really, whew, it was just a, it was a wild ride, I can just tell you, between legislative bodies that need help, um, local governments that need help, and then obviously individual business partners that really need a lot of guidance. And what we're seeing still today is every state that opens brand new just creates another vacuum of talent. And the hardest thing to find in this, in this industry right now is good operators. And that's one thing that Eric and I are very good at. And through um, consulting, we found Western Massachusetts. We fell in love with it and um, decided, you know what, now or never, let's jump back in and get it done and build this company fast. And that's what we did. So that's in a really short time frame of telling you how it went. It felt like forever, but this is uh, this this particular this past couple of years has really flown by. Wow, wow, now that's amazing. You know, you say talk about forever, but actually in this industry, you know, 11 years is not a small time, right? You know, so, you know, there's a lot there that, you know, to unpack in terms of um, being a part of that task force. And, you know, like you were saying, kind of fighting your way through is the only one who kind of has that inside knowledge in that regard, um, you know, and a lot of other things there. But, you know, one thing that, that stood out, um, you know, like we we're talking about um, 11 years being a long time, right? So, um, you know, we see a lot of times, right? And it's kind of dying down a little bit, maybe not, right, about people, from the traditional market, so to speak, kind of talking about, hey, these uh, these financial people coming in, and 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 here you are, right? You're 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 mother of school age kids, and kind of uh, you know maybe not a consumer yourself and everything, right? So can you talk to me about kind of that transition into the business at the beginning, and maybe how uh, you were treated, and maybe now that eleven years in, right, and all this experience, um, maybe if any if that's changed at all, you know, and is did you ever feel like, hey, uh, I'm an outsider coming in or anything like that, or or you know, transitioning, right? I mean, you know, I have people who are soccer moms and they say, you know, I couldn't even talk about this part of my professional career, you know, and until we got a little bit more uh, legitimacy in terms of the the stigma that was associated with it, right? So can you kind of talk to me about that that side as sure. well? Sure. So well, first I'll start with. Um, when I decided to start the industry, I was technically working for our attorney. Mm -hmm. So it was a little easier to explain and I was able to kind of keep my volunteer hats on with full, um, 
with that with I think enough in I guess insurance personally that I felt comfortable with what I was doing and and wasn't um being inauthentic so to speak because I truly was working directly with the attorneys and compliance mm -hmm. but as I do dove into the operations um I did make a decision to walk away quietly step down quietly of um running the football program and and doing you know other things. I still volunteered my kids' school. That was kind of neither here nor there. And it was funny. I did it really quietly. And about a year and a half later, a couple of the coaches got word that I was in the space, and they called me, and they're like, "Is that why you stepped down? That's ridiculous. You should have never done that. Nobody would have cared." And I'm like, "You know what? I didn't want the program to get a black eye, or you know, to get anything at, remotely thrown at it um, with for because of my you know my business decisions." So it made sense at the time to do that. Um, and I remember I didn't even tell really my family because it was just, it was, it could have been really hard to explain. Um, but then you were in Colorado at the time, correct? I was in Colorado, right? Yeah, so, but, yeah. but you know, what's so funny is the medical program and knowing how many people that we help every day in medical, right? I mean, mm -hmm. anybody who's been in this industry understands the reach and the touch mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and has heard these personal heart wrenching. I mean, just break your heart stories of what people have gone through. Yeah. And that this plant provided them some relief and that in, in some ways they tie that to you or your store or somebody that helped them in the store and just how fulfilling that is. It's just, it's a really magical thing. But for whatever reason, especially in the beginning, it wasn't very legitimate, you know, like people just dismissed it and until, until they were personally affected and then saw mm -hmm. relief from the plant. They were the first to be like, whoa, whoa, whoa. But then what do you always hear about? Well, then I got cancer and then I understood. And I'm like, mm -hmm. how can we not be more understanding, you know, about other people's deal? Like, how are we so arrogant that we know what other people should be going through and that they shouldn't be using this plant? And they certainly don't know what they're doing. But then, whoa, when you need it, boy, you better get it. And it's just, it's a fascinating human study, right? But then what was really fascinating to me was when Amendment 64 passed, and we implemented it on that January one day, right? It started and you saw the lines and the headlines. And it was almost like overnight, we became a legitimate business. And I'm like, how weird is that? We were helping hundreds and hundreds and hundreds if not thousands of patients in Colorado. And there's a hundred thousand patients at that time. And that wasn't legitimate, but somehow now that we can sell weed like alcohol, all of a sudden we're real and a real business. And it's just, it's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting, you know, transition, I guess, and an interesting growth of the industry. And I think we kind of saw that a little bit here in Massachusetts too, because we were here consulting during medical before adult use started. And then, you know, it was a very similar kind of thing of how do you work the legacy market with the regulated market? And how do you not step on the toes of the legacy market and provide a ramp for the legacy market to thrive in this if they want to? And if they don't want to, how do we create a business scheme that they can still function? And I think that that's a really important path. I mean, not everyone that grows, you know, under five lights, if, if even that many, one light, you know, can make the transition, nor do they want to make the transition to a thousand. And it's painful. I mean, this is this is not easy. It's it's hard work. It's labor intensive. It's moving water. It's taking measurements. It's data. It's you know killing plants if they don't look good. But we're not we don't we're not an infirmary here. You know we're a commercial cultivation. And if a plant yeah, yeah. is not happy here, they don't they shouldn't be here. <laughs> it's kind of like humans, right? Yeah. Um, we just don't have time for that. And so I think that that's a really interesting problem that we all face in every state of honoring the legacy market making sure that they have space in this and figuring out how to make sure that the, the regulated market just doesn't completely squash them and run them over. And Massachusetts, even just with the latest round of regulations has really done a phenomenal job. They bump the plant counts. Um, they make sure that you can have ongoing genetics so that your, your clone counts don't count against your plant count. Um, now you can have up to five caregivers, five patients that you're a caregiver for. Um, it might be a little bit more. I might be talking about old. I'll have to look. But my point is, is that there is an honoring of where this plant came from and an honoring that there are people that paid ultimate sacrifices to keep this plant alive in the United States and in other countries, as you know. Mm -hmm. And we owe it to them to honor them and to figure out a way for them to exist in this space. And I firmly believe that there is 
zero competition between the two. And I, I really do understand in LA and California market there, it's a little different because there are these dispensers. It, there's a lot to go. There's a lot of people, a lot of space. And this market has been active in California for what, 25 years, 30 years now. Yeah. And so how do you put that back in the can? It, that's really hard. So I would say that the challenge really is how do you, with the most thoughtful way, and causing the least pain to people that have been doing this, how do you figure out a way to, to spread it out and make it okay for everyone to participate at some level? And I believe the faster we do that, I believe the better companies, the better experiences, the better products um, we're gonna have on the market. And I think freedom of choice is the most important thing we can offer in this space. And so that's where we are. Um, I love the legacy market. I love a ton. I learned so much from them. I learned about strains. I learned about different patient stories, about different cultivation methodologies. And I just don't ever want to be, I don't ever want it to be that we're so high and mighty in the regulated market or as big MSOs or whatever, that that, that data that, that these people that have done so much with this plant aren't able to contribute somehow. I just, I don't think that's right. And I also don't think it hurts the market. I think the more people that are aware and thoughtful of cannabis just means we all benefit, period. And that's the biggest focus and as far as cannabis provisions goes. And that is, we want to know, we want to meet you wherever you are on your cannabis journey. Whether you touched this plant in the 60s and haven't been back and now you're back, whether you've never experienced this plant whatsoever, whether you are a daily consumer and are interested in maybe some of our infused products or maybe our new cultivator chemdog who's we're going to bring you know his strains to the market here in massachusetts for the first time as far as in the regulated market that's a really cool thing and i just feel that there's space for everyone and i think this this knowledge of we're only working with this little teeny tiny group of consumers is just false we see more brand new consumers like never have touched the plant ever in our stores than people that consume the product. It's fascinating. And they come to us, in my opinion, because of the experience that we have focused on, which is where are you in your cannabis journey? What do I need to do as a business owner, as a guide in my store to make sure that you get the answers you need for your safe consumption of this product and successful consumption of this product. So we don't want anyone to have a bad time, right? So we really take our time to walk through it. And as you maybe saw, um, even with curbside, even with you know working with people outside so it's COVID safe, we will stand at your car window as long as you will have us and answer whatever questions. If we can't do that or you need to go, we're like, call us back, call us from home, where you can take notes and we'll spend, we have people that actually answer the phone. And that is really unique in the cannabis industry. You don't even get a phone tree. It is, hi, welcome, well, thank you for calling Cannabis Vision. This is blah, 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 how can I help you? I answer the phone all the time. And I think that that is our commitment to humanity. It's our commitment to this plant deserves a one-to-one -one, face to face or person to person interaction to truly honor it and make sure that you as a consumer understand exactly what you have. And we as retailers are being as responsible as we possibly can. And by eliminating this deli style at the counter, pick up your crap and, and you've got people lined up behind you and bud tenders are like, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. Um, that is, we've just completely eliminated that. And it is a high touch. It is um, definitely a little larger payroll, but it's worth it. And we believe it's worth it. And we know it's worth it because our customers tell us. Uh, yeah, definitely. And I mean, uh, that was our experience as well. And, you know, something that, and I appreciate you saying this because, you know, we've been doing this now uh, for almost a year and a half, this podcast, you know, got 60, almost 70 episodes out, you know, done so, we've got to interact with so many different people, right? And one thing that seems to be, you know, and we talk about a lot of passionate kind of topics as well, you know, people have a lot of skin in the game and they have a reason to believe, the, you know, to, to feel the way that they do, right? But this, I think, is the first time where I've heard somebody say, right, about honoring the legacy market and that there is no competition, that there is, you know, space for all of us and how can we really bring in, you know, if the legacy market wants to come and, and, and uh, you know, do it the way that we're doing it, or if not, how can we create that space for everybody to be able to, to you know, co coexist and thrive for everybody, right? And I think that that's, 
uh, so unique and actually very powerful, right? Maybe it's just because of the way that you delivered it, but it was really like, you know, I was like, wow, you know, I haven't, because like you were saying, right, I'm from LA and, uh, you know, talking to people who are really trying to do the right thing. And I mean, I come from the, you know, traditional market, legacy market, you know, that's where I came in, you know, 18 years ago and everything like that. So have experience on that. I have experience now on the compliance side and everything. So it's just, um, you know, to hear that, you know, cause like I was saying in LA, it's, uh, it's very difficult, right? When a person had a, has a dispensary, um, you know, on Sherman Way, and then there's two other dispensaries on there and they're, you know, they haven't transitioned over, right? So they get to have different, uh, different rules for themselves and yeah. you know, different prices. And it's sometimes harder to compete, right? And you have to kind of be that boutique and have that kind of customer experience in order to even justify your existence for it, right? So you know, and, but you, you have experience in Colorado and now in Massachusetts, right? So you have experience in a place where maybe that legacy market um, is still very much felt and, and um, you know, uh, very powerful, obviously. Have you, did you see a difference between kind of Colorado and Massachusetts in that regard, um, you know, in, in um, you know, kind of that overlap, so to speak? Or is it kind of because Massachusetts, you're talking about, you know, people come in and never really had experience with the plant, right? And I mean, of course, like, you know, going there with uh, my mother's in law and they're like super impressed, like, oh my gosh, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I, they're used to, uh, she was like, oh, the, the dealer even came up to the, and I'm like, no, they're not dealers, they're bud tenders, right? So <laughs> that was their experience from 20, 30 years ago, right? So, you know, right. the right. whole thing. And, um, you know, but how, how that kind of overlaps and kind of maybe the difference between the two, you know, states or states that maybe have more of a legacy market. Does that coincide in the same way, you know, with Colorado or with California or Oregon? Or is it something yeah. that we're kind of going to see more in these states that are bringing it, you know, Massachusetts and Illinois? Not like there's no legacy market there, but it's a little bit different. It is definitely different. I think in particular, it's different in Western Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. So the Department of Health did a, a survey um, I don't know, probably about a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago, um, of just just adults, um, anyone over, anyone 21 and over about their cannabis consumption. And 30% of respondents in Western Massachusetts said that they had consumed cannabis recreationally in the past 30 days, but of which the question was asked. And I think that's, first of all, that's one of the highest numbers I've ever heard of. I mean, that's oh. a, you know, Colorado, it was like 11 to now maybe getting closer to 18 to 20. California, I think it, it's a much bigger state, you know, there's a lot larger population. So maybe it's not quite as heavy as that. But I think really what it told us is there's a massive acceptance here. Everybody cultivates, everybody does. Incredible. People that work for us cultivate, we get, I love seeing their pictures. I love seeing, look at my little girl, she's so sassy, you know, I mean, I love that. And the passion and fire behind that. Um, I think, again, I think there is a, there's a difference between, and, and it's a very, it's a really fine line. So, so bear with me on this, but there's a difference between somebody who can open a storefront and advertise to the public and put a sign on the door and say, this is what we are and, and have two different or three different or a million different sets of rules for the people that are right next door to each other, right? Mm. I think that's a complicated model. And I think that that of course is gonna invite not great feelings from anyone, right? It's not, you don't wanna invest a million dollars in a dispensary, participate in the regulated market and somebody's opening right next door to you, not paying taxes, not in this aid to sale system, not labeling, not testing, not, 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 not mm. right? That, that probably isn't the best thing for the consumer either. So I think that there are business models like a dispensary or like delivery or like a home grow or a caregiver. I think all of those have a space. And I think it's just important that we understand and give opportunity for people to participate in those spaces. If you want to be a brick and mortar store, here's what you got to do. Uh -huh. It might not be for you. You might want to stick with, you know, a delivery model or a, you know, caregiver model or something like that. Ultimately, I think what it goes back to me for, or goes, goes for me, goes back to for me, excuse me, is um, I garden at home. Not just cannabis, but I grow tomatoes. I grow lettuce. I grow beans and all kinds of stuff. Guess what? I still go to the grocery store almost every day and buy the exact same things that I cultivate. There is just, there is not this, you know, for me, it just makes me smarter about what the tomatoes I'm purchasing. Uh -huh. So I kind of look at it like, 
we can be hobby growers, we can be serious cultivators and, and really wanna grow great medicine for a select group of people. Um, I just believe it's more important that we have space for people to operate in the model that they wanna operate and make sure that we don't make it so incredibly difficult that the legacy market it says, nah, 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 I don't wanna do it. We have to make it simple and cost-effective and working with the existing structures as much as we possibly can, understanding that we're gonna butt heads about a few things, you know, like in Massachusetts, it's a really tough place to grow in the regulated market. Uh -huh. We are not allowed to use anything. We can't even use Clonex. We can't use, I mean, we can use no pesticides. We can use nutrients as long as they, um, you know, don't have anything horrible in them. It's just NPK. Um, but it's other than that, we can't spray anything on the plants. We can't introduce anything that is chemical, even organics we can't use. So it's, it's a really challenging environment. So who, who better to go to than people that have operated in the legacy market growing here in this environment, which yeah. is humid, hot, weird, you know, we got all kinds of stuff that grows here differently than in Colorado, where we have 300 days of sunshine. Um, it's dry climate for the most part, you know, a little different there. So what a great opportunity to go to these craft farmers that I, that I, we just love and get their insights on how to do it. And we actually hire them or we contract with them to, to buy every bit of their craft cultivation that, I mean, that's really what it's all about for me. Um, and I personally identify this market as far as the legacy and the regulated market in Massachusetts, very much to the desire for people to be able to go to farmers markets and buy their produce right from the farmers. And I think that that's super important. And I think we need to honor that. And I think it's the right thing to do. I think it's the right thing to do to buy local, grow local. And I think as a society, we're seeing that right now as supply chains are crumbling all over the place. This, this international supply chain idea is challenging right now. Um, I mean, who knew that during a pandemic, Home Depot is only going to let you buy one shop back. You can't buy two, you can only buy one. I mean, it's all supply chain stuff. It's really fascinating. And I just, I feel like local um, people want to know where this came from. You see that with people, how they choose their restaurants. You see that how they choose where they're going to buy their produce or their meats. And I think that that is going to intensify much more during this pandemic as we try to find our way out of it than going back to the Walmarts and supermarkets and that kind of thing. So I just personally think this is this is the route and this is the way we need to go. And that's our commitment. And we love to craft cultivators. We love telling stories about guys who've been growing this plant in their backyard for 20 years or you know whatever the, whatever yeah. the situation might be. I mean, obviously look at our director of cultivation, it's Ken Dog. I mean, you yeah. cannot get any more legacy than that. And he's you know had an incredible life an incredible story and really um unjust story and you know paid the ultimate price for a flipping plant which is infuriating um and how much that up, uh, just you know upset his entire life and to see the pride on his face when he comes into this regulated facility with his badge just going i did it and I'm like, yeah you did it and we're just trying to honor as much of him and what he's gone through and put our money where our mouth is and support that craft grower, support that 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 legacy cultivator who paid a big price to be in this market. And by the way, has has access to the most amazing genetics, right? That he personally cultivated and, and managed and kept alive during all of this. I mean, that's a great story. Well, that that would make me want to shop here. No, exactly. <laughs> that's been, you know, there's a lot of reasons to shop and that's, you know, definitely want to, you know, touch on that as well. And, you know, I think you have that, like, first of all, you come so genuine and so sweet and so much fun to talk to, but you also have that vision, like I said, that's so unique and you're, you're actually, um, you know, executing on that, you know, having Kem Dog, you know, uh, cultivating and everything and having the legacy market mixing with the legal and, and being able to do it in the right way, like you said, and being able to bring people in the right way. Um, I definitely want to talk about, you know, kind of provisions and the experience there as well. Um, before we move into that, you know, a few times it's come up. You know, in terms of, uh, you know, you're talking about, for instance, um, you know, the survey of 30%, which is extremely high. That's crazy, right? And, you know, talking about being able to provide uh, customer experience and everything. And, um, but, you know, talking about data, data-driven company, right? And, and kind of the data that goes behind that. Um, can you talk to me about the importance of 
uh, having data, where do you source your data and how do you execute on that data? Because I think sometimes people get kind of overwhelmed, first and foremost, not knowing where to start. Second of all, you know, okay, great. Like, what do I make of this now, right? I can look at these, you know, all these numbers for days on end, but what do I do, right? So then how do you actually turn that and translate it into, um, you know, uh, real actions that we can take and to optimize our businesses? Three, two, one, two, ignition, lift off. We at Calican are passionate about cannabis and CBD marketing, branding, SEO content, and web design. If you are a cannabis owner and you know you need an uptick in business or an upgrade in the way your customers perceive you, come check us out at calican.com and schedule a time to speak with us today. Um, it's a, that's a phenomenal question. So in my cultivation in Colorado, we were capturing a million points of data, a million points, mm -hmm. just in the cultivation. Mm -hmm. And that's all great, but what are you going to do with it? And that's really the, the thing. You, you, you have systems that will help you with the data, that collect the data. So whether it's your point of sale, um, whether you have a, you know, whether you're working with um, a loyalty program, whether you're um, tied into certain cultivation metrics that you that you record um, every single day. Um, it's 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 no different than kind of how the state uses metric, which is what they use here in Massachusetts. Metric tracks all kinds of stuff yeah. and is really smart and has a bunch of AI technology in it that points out big deltas. Like, hey, what's up with this? This is a big delta, um, and kind of alerts people about it. Well, that was kind of where we started. We started with the basics of what 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 can we capture? What do we know is important? Let's, use, let's stick with the cultivation because it's a good example. So capturing highs and lows in temperature, capturing every bit of humidity data, capturing what strains were in what room during what time of year and how did they perform, knowing that strains are coming from clones, so they're all genetically equal. Um, that, that was just the starting point. And then that grew into, wait a minute, we have, now we're tracking parts of the room where we have a hot part of the room and that's always the outside wall that faces south. Your room is always gonna be a little more challenging when you have that, it, no matter what engineering you've done, I promise you, you're gonna have a little bit of a hiccup on a hot wall as, as you will on a cold wall. And then figuring out, well, wait, there's certain strains that don't care. So let's make sure we always put those strains there. Well, if you're not tracking this data, if you're not collecting it and then tracking it, you're never gonna know that. And what that can mean is you have four or five plants that are underperforming in a room of 300 plants, but guess what? That adds up, that adds up over time. Uh -huh. So cannabis, just like a lot of things, including football, is a game of inches. And so every little tweak that we can make, whether it's one degree or 1% humidity, or even less than that, makes a difference in that, in that output that you get. And all the plants, you know, relatively need the same amount of time. They need the same amount of energy. They need the same amount of manpower. So the key in a, in a highly regulated, heavily, heavily taxed industry is to make sure that you are as efficient as you possibly can be. And that goes right down to plant placement, which is what we're learning right now in Sheffield. We are learning, wow, this room runs really cold on this end and really warm on that end. And how are we going to fix that? And what plants are happy over here? And what plants are really sad over there? And let's swap them up. Um, I mean, that's just, that is just data tracking and, and really having a keen eye to what's going on. You can take that exact same type of analysis right down to your sales, right? And that is looking at, well, statewide, hey, we're, you know, the state, we're doing about 21% vaporizers. Well, huh, we're not quite at that number. Why is that? And the only way you know that is to track actually what you're selling. And we're fortunate in that we have good um, SaaS partners to our point of sales, Flow Hub. Um, we use Dutchie for our um, online ordering. They do a phenomenal job of tracking. Um, and they've been an amazing partner. I, I can't even tell you, their CEO is so open to suggestions and so open to understanding why we need certain data points from them, as well as helping to make sure that our website analytic guys can dissect what's happening at the at the at their website because that's part of it, right? You know, in the in the e-commerce world, which so many of us are in this this online ordering phenomenon right now. Mm -hmm. Um, you have to adjust and think like e-commerce, even though you're not completely finishing the transaction online, which hopefully will be solved sooner than later. But being able to understand that 
well, we've got a 30% abandonment rate, meaning that people get things in their cart and then they walk away and don't ever complete it. It's like, what's that all about? Um, it, are they just making a shopping list for when they come in? Because that, that could be what happened. That's what that could be what's happening. Or do they just get to the end and then see the total price and see the tax and go, holy crap. And so that way we can kind of track exactly when people are exiting us. But the most, really most important thing that we did on the e-commerce side is we made sure that our website mirrored good e-commerce sites. When you think of good e-commerce, who do you think of? I mean, Amazon, eBay, um, Zappos, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a reason and a method to the madness. And whatever we can do to replicate that as, as closely as we can, knowing that we can't check you completely out yet here in Massachusetts, we can't have you pay online. Um, and we can't take credit cards, which is kind of universal. There's a universal issue with that. But understanding what is driving the customer and understanding their behaviors behind a screen has really helped us tighten that, that part of our market. It's probably, I wanna say it's probably about 40% of our tickets, 50% of our tickets are online. Um, and, and we get them kind of before we even walk in the door, but then we still get throughout the day, we get more tickets. Uh -huh. And then we also have a handful of people that still wanna come inside because they've got a lot of questions and they need that face-to-face. Um, so that, that those are just examples of if I know that my demographic is 50 and over um, and I know that they're traveling from here, there and everywhere because I get their zip code information, um, I'm able to do better targeting and better thoughtful digital marketing to them, um, even adjusting who's greeting them at the door. I mean, we can be that smart about it. And that is the key because we're competing for the dollar that's in your pocket, just like the grocery store, just like the liquor store, just like any type of retailer. We're all competing for that same dollar. It's not some magical cannabis dollar that exists out there. We have to do our job as, as, as a, consumer, a consumer product company and to make sure that we have a good list, a good, a good um, choice so that we have lots of options on the menu from flour to to infuse products, tinctures, topicals, concentrates, pre-rolls, pre-rolls. Oh my gosh, they're so popular. People just love them. But also monitoring, just like, you know, kind of what we were chatting about before we got on, which is how COVID is really shifting a lot mm -hmm. of this stuff. So now people are more compelled to order and pick up in their car. They're, they're trained that you can do that everywhere. Yeah. So it's not just unique to us. They're, you're getting that experience no matter where you go. Um, and the other thing that obviously this is creating, and I know I feel it, I'm sure I'm sure you do, I'm sure everyone in this current situation, um, not just COVID, but also political in the United States, we just have a big unrest issue going on here. And there's a lot of anxiety around that. There's a lot of stress around that. And um, it's kind of interesting. I feel like America is going through what it's like to operate in the cannabis industry which is every single day, something's new is happening. There's something new that you have to change. You have to change how you're operating, new rules, new regulations, different way of enforcing something, a bulletin on you've done this and now, you've done, now you can't do that anymore. Now you got to do it this way. We're kind of dealing with that too, right? It's like, oh, now we need you to get a vaccine. Oh, no, no, now, now we need all of you to get a vaccine because now you guys weren't doing it. And, and then kind of working through, okay, when, where am I going to be in 28 days to make sure that I can get my second vaccine? And it's just things like that, which are really interesting. Um, and an interesting parallel as I'm seeing parents that are frazzled out of their minds because they're now teachers and working full time. Um, and in, in, in particular, um, how that's affecting women, you know, I mean, that not to dive off to a whole nother subject, we should do a podcast just on that. Oh yeah. Um, okay. But in we particular- We didn't get into that. You know, but it, it's amazing, right? It's women who are leaving the workforce right now. And that is very, very scary as a woman leader who oh. is constantly looking for great talent in the space, not just of women of everybody, but in particular, I want to see more women participate. I want to see more people of color participate. Uh -huh. And um, this COVID thing is really shifting that whole story. So we know that there's stress. We know that people right now, um, New Frontier Data, um, boy, they do a great job as is BDS. I love them both and they do attack it differently. So we subscribe to both. But um, BDS just did, uh, did a whole bunch of information on COVID and I'll give you just, or excuse me, New Frontier did a whole bunch of information on COVID. And it's really very interesting. So a third of purely social cannabis consumers who only ever consumed when they were with somebody else have not used cannabis since the pandemic started. Think about that. A third, 
of social users. That means people that wanted to go and like pass the joint around or whatever, oh. always always consumed in social situations, oh. they are no longer consuming cannabis. Isn't that fascinating? Oh. The other fascinating trend, which um, to me is, is really interesting because it's not a demographic that we heavily market to, um, but it's people that have school age kids are definitely turn into cannabis for some help. And it is remarkable. And um, that in particular translates to women too, because we know that women are leaving the workforce to, to manage children at home right now. And that is just a fascinating place to be, right? I mean, how interesting that now I can go, hey mama, I know you're stressed, this might help you. <laughs> I know you're probably not sleeping very much. I know you're freaking out because of this, this, and this, and this. And you've got to be a teacher now. This product might help ease some of your anxiety might make you just take the edge off a little bit so that you're a better mama and a better teacher. Isn't that interesting? I mean, we've yeah. never been able to even talk about that. No, it's, it's, it's been crazy. You know, one of my good friends, friend of the show, client, Amy Chin, you know, she, uh, combat her days. That's her whole thing, you know, helping stressed out moms who were, you know, she, that was her thing before COVID and now it's an even newer thing. And she's talks about how many people are coming in, you know, because obviously kids at home, you know, they are now taking on a whole huge role, right? In terms yeah. of, and that's why they, a lot of them are having to leave the workforce and a lot of different things going on. You know, the kids are at home and, um, you know, the, the teachers aren't there, the teachers are on Zoom and it's like now they, they're also doing homework and learning uh, learning new languages and, and learning math again and everything right. like that that goes along with it, you know? Um, and, it, and it's been very, very difficult in that regard. And how do we cope? Right. What kind exactly. Of, what and I'd much rather, that, much rather than cope with cannabis than alcohol. Right. Yeah, I that's mean, for sure. The that's, kids know the difference. You know, we talk about that, you know, but the fact of the matter is that we do need uh, coping mechanisms. We do need outlets. Um, and the kids, you know, notice uh, the alcohol in a lot different way than the cannabis, obviously, you know, so uh, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's a brand new thing. And definitely, you know, well, let me let me give you one more stat to chew on just because I think yeah. it really is indicative of what's going on with our society right now. And this is national national data. Um, so from November 19th of 2019 to March 20th of 2020, according to New Frontier, um, the average spend was two hundred thirty five dollars in a, in a can and a monthly average. That's how much on a monthly on a monthly basis people were spending towards cannabis. Between April 20th and October, April 2020 and October 2020, that number went up 32% to $310. Wow. If that doesn't tell you people are stressed and freaking out, I don't know what else will. And what a great space to be in as far as in this industry to actually be able to offer some peace and relief to people that are really challenged right now. Well, definitely. I mean, I think we, uh, you know, talking about redistributing the wealth. And, um, you know, it comes to mind, Bob Marley, right? Then belly full, but we hungry, you know? So obviously yeah. most of the masses are, are upset, you know? So and, um, it's kind of, uh, you know, you were talking about, you, you obviously have a unique perspective in the sense that, you know, earlier talking about you were one of 14 on the board, the only person who actually had an inside understanding of how it actually works, right? And now you're, you know, obviously, you know, as a woman saying, I'm the only person in a meeting, you know, who's a woman and, I mean, any perspective, you know, tell, tell me a little bit more about that. You know, you're, what can we do? I think, um, you know, talk to, you know, the social equity side and how it's like, yeah, they, they bring me to the table, but they don't let me speak really, or they don't take my ideas seriously. You know, it's kind of like I'm there to mark, you know, check off a box kind of thing as opposed to, um, you know, really there for my merit and all that stuff. How can we, you know, and it's, question that I ask a lot of people because there's different answers of how to you know kind of bring about the solution how do you um see you know change coming in the sense of being able to come bring more diversity bring more women uh and allowing it to be organic and you know where these rich white men are so so to speak you know letting it happen so to speak right I mean I hate to say it like that right but where it's like uh greed you know wants more greed you know and they want to hold more money and it's like do we have to wrestle from them or is it something that we can all have a a, a place and understanding and and how, how do you see that change coming about um the not the what i know for sure is we have to wrestle it yeah. there is no there is no nuancing here and it, we are at war uh -huh. and i don't mean that in a like i don't mean that in a mean way i mean that in a anybody that is fighting for a piece of the pie right now which is owned by a handful of humans, most of them white and most of them male, 
There is no let, they will not let go. It is the nature of the beast. The, 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 the uh, power struggle that is built is built to support the power. You know, it's yeah. not built to support you and me. Yeah, they talk so about the, the, the systems, you know, the system's working great, right? I mean, the, the system that's- Oh yeah, the up, system is not broken. It yeah, is yeah, working- Yeah, the system's not broken that. at all. You know? Yeah, my daughter, my daughter reminds me that all, all the time. And I mean, whether you're talking about criminal justice or whether you're talking about a, a million things, right? It's oh. just the system is doing exactly what it was designed to do. And so until we absolutely break the system, oh. there's no fixing it, right? It, we are going to be a cog in the wheel and we are going to get what we get and too damn bad. Oh. So how do you change it? First and foremost, I will I say this all the time. I am a bit, huge proponent of it. And in my opinion, um, and I'm really hoping that my kids do this, my son in particular, who is of color, um, I really, really hope um, he does it because he's brilliant and he should and he's charismatic and he's darling and well-spoken and has a degree and he would be phenomenal at it. So what is the number one thing we can do? Run for office. That is the first thing we have to do. Women and people of color need to run. And what does that mean? It means getting on your homeowner's board. It means getting on the school board. It means participating at the grassroots level because that is where everyone comes from. They don't all of a sudden just tap people on the shoulder. President Obama wasn't elected because he was just running around. He actually did all these things. He was an activist. He was an organizer and he went through the process quickly because he's super talented and brilliant. Um, and people tapped him on the shoulder and were like, you are going to be this. But had he never been an, an organizer, had he never run for any other thing, he wouldn't be here. So that is the number one thing we can do as human beings in America is to run for office. And it is scary. And you see what these people go through. And why would you ever want to put yourself through the brain damage of doing it? But if you don't do it, who does? So that's the first and foremost thing that I think is the critical part, the critical path. If we're going to talk about our industry and why it's so hard to get into, it's the regulations. I mean, Maynard, think about it. I have to invest just, just one of my stores is a six figure security system, uh -huh. six figures. Uh -huh. And that's regulations. The, the liquor store doesn't have that regulation. Banks don't even meet my, my standard of security, but I'm required to do so because of the state regulations. Who do you think put the state regulations in place? White men, yeah. right? So when you talk about where does the inequity start, it starts with these ridiculous, burdensome, expensive regulations. To operate my business, to even get a location, even just to get it at least negotiated, like that's the least of it, but that's a really hard thing to do. If you're a person of color, you don't have a ton of capital and all the landlords are white, right? So right, right there, we have that imbalance as well, but it's just absolutely exacerbated by this, you know, thousands of pages of regulations that I have to operate by. So that's the first thing. Um, you know, we, we have to address that the system as written, so in Massachusetts, even though we are massively aware and hear about all the time and the, the um, commission is trying so hard to address equity, they're not addressing the number one most expensive thing, which is how to be a regulated industry. It's outrageously expensive and it shouldn't be. Going back to the electeds and how important it is for all of us to run for office. And believe me, I'm considering what my plan of attack is. It's probably going to be here locally in Lee that I will run, but um, just as a select board member, um, and I don't mean just, it's a very important role. It's a very important role to participate in your local community and get your community, yeah. you know, you change, you change your little piece of the world, the world changes, right? So it's, it's the same mentality. But I think ultimately, um, until we get our arms around how ridiculous the regulations are around this plant, when alcohol and opioids do not operate in anywhere near the same capacity, keep in mind that opioids in the state of Arkansas can be delivered by FedEx. Fentanyl comes in 50 pound gallons delivered to a pharmacy via FedEx. Think about that. Yep. It's yep. shocking, isn't it? So how do we level the playing field? We level the playing field by making it less expensive to operate. And the number one most expensive thing there is in the industry is the regulations. No, yeah, and I mean, I totally agree. The whole thing is, you know, I mean, growing up, 
uh, this has been one of the things I've been most interested in my whole life growing up. And there was a time as well where I was like, Maynard, you're going to be the governor of uh, California at so-and-so year and, you know, and all these kind of things. And then I started thinking, you know, and maybe because I would become more jaded, a little bit more cynical. And I started thinking, you know, just playing the same rules with the system, you know, you're still playing within that system, you know? So it's like, you know, obviously you're running, of course, and we are seeing changes that are being made, you know, over the years and we're seeing a lot of progressiveness and everything going, uh, you know, coming into play. Um, but at the same time, we're still talking about, playing within that system, right? And having to play by those rules and the same thing like you're saying uh, in terms of the regulations, right? These, reg these regulations were created by these people who want to maintain their power and they know that only they and their friends will be able to pay for this. So they're keeping it and without actually saying, hey, this is for us, not for you. They're writing it in, in you know, in, like you were saying in a financial way where they know who will be able to afford it and who won't be able to afford it. And we you know we can write in social equity all this stuff, but they won't be able to afford it. So guess what? They're going to get loans from us and we're going to take that percentage. We're going to take that power from them immediately. You know, exactly. so it's, it's, you know, it's, it's kind of like this catch 22 where we're talking about the system's broken, but we need to play now within the system um, in order to make a change. Right. I mean, where is it that, where does it come down to the, to the point where we just say, you know what, you know, me, fuck it. We're not going to play by these rules anymore. We're going to create a new thing. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and, you know, that coming about, I think people are, there's so much social unrest. It's almost scary, right? It's scary to see what's going on. Um, in another way, it's kind of like, you know what? I mean, yeah, I mean, it's been coming to this, you know, it's been coming to this for a long time, you know, of course it's coming and to it's this. Needed. It's gonna happen at and some it's point. Needed. Yeah. And it's needed. And we need to flip over the table. Yeah. Um, I don't want to flip over the table, like the, what we're seeing right now, because it's all that is, is a whole bunch of white people the capital bitching about life's not fair it's like are you kidding me you i mean this is, the counter, this is the counter of what was happening early in the year right so i mean of course yeah. like, they were bitching early in the year about what was happening in the year and now here they now are seeing that uh you know it's kind of this that's how it's kind of moving you know but yeah. there's something going on um right you know. well how do we how do we get here maynard i mean let's let's be let's be very honest with one another and i will be deadly honest with you we have become complacent as a nation why women are still making 70% of what men make is because we're complacent with what we have. Isn't this enough? Isn't this enough? Well, you have schools now and you can go to, you can go to, you can own property now and you can have a credit card now and you can get a mortgage now and oh, you can even go to college now. Um, I mean, you know, you, you think about it. We were all, we were all um, like rocked into complacency. Like, well, we gave you this and we gave you that. And shouldn't you just be happy with what you got? Well, no, you shouldn't be because it's not equal. And, and, and look, I'm the first to say, and I will quote my dear friends from at Zingerman's Deli in Michigan, who tell, teach this on a regular basis. We, we train with them all the time. But um, life is like, you know, how do they, how do they say it? Um, fair is a planet and we don't live there. So, you know, that's, that is true. Like, you know, this whole notion of it should be fair just because it's fair. Well, that would be great, but that's utopia and we don't have that. So how do we level the playing field? Look, I have a lot of ideas on it. And I think that there's, the, the, the in, in particular with cannabis, the challenge is because the regulatory scheme makes things so expensive. Um, and because we don't honor the legacy market like we should by like saying, hey, you have 10 plants in your basement. Great, as long as they're tested and as long as you're tracking them, maybe you should be able to introduce that into the, into the regulated market. Why not? What is the harm? As long as it's tested and tracked, who cares? Um, that, you know, that, that's one small example. Um, but ultimately what, what it is, is that because it's so complicated to get in, because it's so expensive and who has the money? The white guys have the money. So the, are the white guys gonna wanna get, I even have trouble raising money. As a woman who's been doing this since 2009, I have trouble raising money. They want to take my arm, my firstborn child, oh, oh yeah. you know, every, my cat, you know, everything that's valuable to me and give you this little piece, you know, because the money still has the power. Uh -huh. And how, the only way to fix that is to change the amount of money that's required in order to participate. Uh -huh. And that that's in every possible schema, scheme of what we exist in, whether it be the mortgage lending, whether it be getting a car, whether it be opening a bank account, getting a credit card. I mean, it is, we see discrimination constantly. I mean, just think about it. In 1973, 74, when Richard Nixon was 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 impeached, and I was nine or ten years old, um, 
a woman couldn't own a woman couldn't get a mortgage a woman couldn't get birth control without her husband signing that she was it was okay to give her birth control i mean think about that i can't even fathom that i mean there's still so many issues right there's so many so many problems but i mean that's not even uh and that's how it's it just, worked for thousands of years already right i mean so it's not even uh it's not even an it's, American thing. It's a it's a human thing, or you know, it's a human thing. It's just it's insane. So I mean, so we we haven't come that far, and it's only been this very short time time frame. I'm I'm 54 years old, so it's been since you know since I was a kid. It's in my generation that these changes happened, and yet we you know that people are like look how far you've come. Look at you, and I'm like, oh my god, you know, white guys still own my company. I I own a little piece of it, but white guys own my company. That's a fact. It's just how the money works. So again, how do you change this by by making by making sure that that it's not so expensive to participate? That's the number one thing that I can think of. And I'm asked all the time, how would you fix equity? And I would be, you know, I would fix equity by including the legacy market in a more thoughtful way and making it less onerous to get into the business. And again, it's about a plant that doesn't harm anyone. It's just absurd. I would love to see the same regulations on fentanyl. I would love to see that. I would love to see trace and track that has to happen, like the level I have to happen. It's 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 insane to me. So you know, and, and around what? Well, around a whole bunch of guys that saw an opportunity that when cannabis becomes legal, it's going to become this giant IPO, and everybody's going to make a ton of money. And by sheer nature of that, I will not participate in the stock market. I hate it. I think it is absolutely a lie and a farce, and I just will not participate. So. You know, whatever happens in cannabis when people just keep making money in the stock market, good on you. But that's not what I'm about. So I think ultimately um, the biggest change we can make is to change the regulatory scheme. And then the second biggest change that we can make is making sure that every single tax dollar that is generated past paying for the department that regulates us, which should be a lot smaller and a lot less regulations than happen. Um, ultimately, most of those dollars should go into a fund to make sure that equity can participate. And that's, that's what should happen. You know, we were Billy, I mean, look at the, look at how much money Colorado's made. Look at how much money California is going to make. These are giant numbers yeah. that should go back to the community to make sure that people aren't being incarcerated. That's the number one thing that we can do too, is just like get people out of jail for this plan. It's just disgusting to me. So that's, that's that one. Then making sure that there's a there's a solid pool of money, thoughtfully, I don't mean just like willy nilly given out, I mean thoughtfully given out to, to people that are committed to running a business, right? And that's important. And and just making sure that everything we're doing is not is not flipping the bird on the backs of the people that really paid ultimate sacrifices to make sure we can do what we're doing right now. And that's the key. And I think the other hard part about this is even as a business owner, and I've done this for, for you know, 11, 10 years, it's 10 years. Um, this is a really hard business. It, it is, it's brutal. And I wouldn't, I seriously wouldn't wish it on anyone. People are always <laughs> like, oh, it seems, so, it seems so fun. You're growing weed and da, da, da. And I'm like, you're growing weed. I have 130 employees. I'm in a pandemic. Um, there are so many things about this industry that are challenging, whether it be the software that's involved, whether it be the state sponsored track and trace program and all the issues that are wrong with that. Um, I mean, we could go on and on about how hard it is just dealing with 130 human beings is really challenging, right? I mean, just being an employer is really challenging. And, and then, then by the way, you, you have to grow a plant successfully pass testing successfully. And there is no like turning on the factory to get more plant material out. Like there's just days. That's all you, it's time. It's a time-based continuum. Oh. And if you don't, if you're not successful in those 120 days of starting that little baby as a seed and getting that all the way through to packaged in a bottle and on a shelf, you know, as well as I do, I've had crop failures. It's painful yeah. and expensive. And there's just no... There's no writing that. It's just, it's a hard business and I do it because I'm good at it. And I do it because it's the right thing for me to do right now. And I, and I want to be a leader. I want to see change through the, through this, through this process. And if I can't, if I, you know, me, Megan Sanders can't leverage what I know about this industry to change some things, then wow, we really suck. 
So I, I just, you know, I think my biggest, the reason, the number one reason why I got into this industry is because of mass incarcerations for non, nonviolent drug oh. offenders. Oh. And it's not just that, but it's the perpetuation of once you're in the system, you know, once you learn about the criminal justice system, oh, yeah. you really oh, understand. Talk about the a system. system. The system, the system, system is agree, not broken. You know? It's just, it's just, it's just uh, Talking about money and getting more money to, to rich white guys, you know, and uh, yeah. that's just like, I mean, that's just easy money, you know? It's, it's structured money. slavery. It's, 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 that's all it is. It yeah. is absolute slavery. Yeah. And we just figured out a way to make it pretty. Yeah. So we can all blame somebody. That. Well, you should have played by the rules. You should yeah. have played by the rules. Well, we wouldn't be in that position if no, no, no. And we all know that's bullshit. It's you know, just crap, right? That that was hands down the number one reason why I got into this space when I understood the numbers. And then obviously that was kind of like a big pie in the sky for me. I was like, oh my God, we got to fix this. This is awful. And then still realizing that black and brown people are arrested in the state of Colorado where this has been legally sanctioned for a really long time at a 10X, 10X proportion to white people for a plant that is legalized and regulated and I, any, any 21 and over can go and buy it across the counter, but this is still happening. So that was the wake up call for me. And then what led further down the rabbit hole of the criminal justice system, which is again, a whole nother series of podcasts is understanding that the bail system is really what screws people right? Because if you can't pay for bail, you can't get out of jail, you lose your job, then you lose your house, and then you're right back where you started, or worse, or worse where you started. Mm -hmm. And really understanding how that all works. And how that all works and how often this is just about a joint in a pocket, or a seed, or a little bit of residue in a pipe, and that that's what is ruining people's lives still today. It's just disgusting to me. Yeah. And I look at states like Illinois and their governor of who I want to just go give a giant hug because of all the just expungements they've done. You don't, you don't have to fill out a single piece of paper. We're going through all the charges and we're just gonna, you're done. You're out. You're out of the system. You're out of the system forever. I mean, they've done hundreds of thousands of people. I mean, that is how it should happen. The state of Massachusetts should be doing that right now. State of Colorado should be doing that right now. State of Connecticut should be doing it right now and on and on and on. It is not you, you as the person who's already been harmed by the drug war and by systemic racism have to come and fill out all these papers and get a lawyer and then maybe we'll hear you and then six months later, maybe you'll hear about it. Screw that. We know who you are. We Believe me, the criminal justice system is brilliant in keeping track of people, especially people they want to track. Yep. And they just, it, it just should be done. Done. And so what is the big thing that could happen today? Well, we could just let's wipe all those felonies and, and, and misdemeanors off the records. Let's just start right there. So that's a huge part. Um, ultimately, though, it's funding, it's fairness, it's how do we provide access to, to make this all happen. And I would love to be, I would love to be an incubator. I would love to make that happen. The incubators that we've seen for equity generally charge a pound of flesh, you know, it's, it's a big, big number that you end up owing. And that to me is um, not in line with what we're trying to do, you know? So let me tell you what we're doing about it at Canada Provisions and, um, and hold on one second. Hey, Taylor, can you please get my charger? Sorry, <laughs> sorry about that. It's all good. It's, uh, it's in my computer bag. Um, what can we do about it? So yeah, the, the, for computer. Um, the our vision for our manufacturing in particular is to create a co-op kitchen that we don't want equity. We don't want, we're, we're not going to, we're not going to take a pound of flesh out of you. We want to see what products you want to make. We don't want you to have to give up your day job. We don't want you to have to go raise a ton of money and get, and you know, get a compliance officer and a director of security. And, you know, we'll, we'll pay for all that because we're going to do our own kitchen anyway, but we're not 24 hours in the kitchen. So why don't we set aside significant amount of time every day that people that have an idea about bringing a consumer product to the cannabis market can come and create that product and we'll help them get it tested. We'll help them formulate it. We'll help them get it shelf stable and all those things. And the only thing we're going to ask out of it is that we have the first right of refusal to sell it at our stores. Oh. 
And if going all of this stuff, if doing all this stuff works and you're like, holy crap, I want to be in the cannabis industry and this is what I'm going to do, then we will help you figure that out. We'll go to our lenders. We'll go to our, you know, we'll go to a whole bunch of people to help you figure out your space and your place. And if you really want to make this your full-time business, but today you don't know yet. You don't even know if your product's going to be accepted and what a huge roll of the dice to do, right? That's a big expensive proposition in consumer markets, which by the way, most fail. Most are not successful. Oh, yeah. So that is our vision. And that's even that's a hard vision because of course our investors are like, well, how do we make money on that? I'm like, it's not about making money. It's about doing the right thing. It's about being the, 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 the guiding star of this is one way that it can be done. We have a kitchen, we have compliance, we have security, we have all of those things and you'll never be alone. We'll always be with you because we have to, we owe it to our investors, we owe it to ourselves to make sure our license isn't put in jeopardy. But, but why would we do it any other way? And there's so many really great restaurant concepts that have come out of this type of, of, of situation where you're able to take your food truck concept into a brick and mortar concept and if you were successful there, you can t you can at least have a, a business model to go to a bank and say, see how much money I've already made? See how much I've already sold? That's a different concept, right? And it's different if your consumer market is already for sale in a in a store in a in a state regulated market. Think about how much easier it's going to be to raise money. That's huge. Yeah. So that's the vision. Um, a lot of people are doing that. They have a vision on the co-op grows. I think that's a little challenging It's because just the, the, the biometrics that need to be in place to make sure there's no cross-contamination and uh, other things that could happen in a co-grow space is a little bit more challenging, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't say I wouldn't do it. I just know it's harder. This makes a lot more sense to me. And I truly believe this is where the market's going. And we all see that. We see that in the numbers. It's going from that raw flour to the milligram model. And that's where most new adopters enter the market is yeah. in a milligram model. So why not empower one of the greatest little chocolatiers here in the, in the Berkshires to, to start a new business model? That's great, but he doesn't have to give up his day job. He can do his day job. And then and, you know, a few hours a week, he comes over and works in our kitchen and we sell it and we get feedback and reviews and we see how it's going and off to the races. And maybe he's like, this is really hard. I don't ever want to do it. And I'm like, I'm so glad it didn't cost you any dollars. <laughs> yeah, <You know? laughs> years and money and raising and everything. I mean, and and really ultimate good. failure, really failure is the biggest thing. I mean, you have to realize, Maynard, I would say 90% of cannabis businesses are bankrupt. They just don't know it yet. Uh -huh. wow. And that's a fact. The 280E element alone is makes this a, the, a, a really impossible business model. Uh -huh. And I can just tell you, as a standalone retail, if you are at 9% profitability, you're doing really, really well. Uh -huh. Most are not. They, and they just don't know it yet. I mean, that's the facts. They don't know it. So that, that's a huge focus of ours. And then the other huge focus that we're doing, you know, just from the small, tiny contributions we can make or calling our legislators um, on a very regular basis. And now that we have a switch, we have a, we have a Democratic uh, president, we've got a Democratic Congress. Um, you know, there's a lot of hope writing that the Moores Act and the Bank Safe Banking or Fair Banking Act will make it through. And that's a game changer for the entire industry. And that's what everybody's waiting, but that's also what the rich white guys are waiting for. So we have to be, you know, we have to be thoughtful shepherds of what's going to happen when that does happen. Because that's, I'm telling you what, Sally bar the doors when that happens. You want to talk about corporate greed? Yeah. Go for it. <laughs> you know? So I, I don't know. I think there's, you know, I think the cannabis industry is a, a very interesting mirror for society, right? This, this is the place where uh, changes are made, right? You know, we're talking about the slavery and, and how people are, you know, modern slavery. And, and um, you know, they say that if, uh, something is uh, you live by the sword, you die by the sword, right? So this is the way that also we have to, uh, to make a change, right? This is the way that We've uh, been in the system. This is the way that we have to bring people out as well, you know, in the same way. And, and I love that idea. You know, you call it like an incubator kind of thing. And, you know, we, we see these obviously all over tech and, you know, there's a big, all this, you know, Silicon Valley is pretty problematic in its own right. We see that. I think sometimes we give them a free, uh, I think that there's some benevolent people who have our best interests in mind. And we all know that that's uh, not necessarily the case all the time. But, um, but yeah, I mean, that's an amazing idea, you know, in terms of giving people that space, give them the shot to do that. Um, and to grow their own business and see where it goes from there, you know, and uh, yeah, and hopefully we're really successful at it. Hopefully it can be a model that we can, 
Like, wouldn't it be great if in order to participate in a highly regulated industry, you had to do this model? Like, wouldn't that be cool? Amazing. I mean, you, everybody should have to go through something like that, but yeah, very good. So we talked a lot about, you know, the obstacles facing obviously society. I mean, we can go on and this is stuff that I'm so passionate about. We talk about, you know, being yeah. passionate about cannabis and marketing and all this stuff, but I'm so passionate about these issues. This is what I've grown up thinking about, you know, but, um, you know, talking about the obstacles facing society and facing the industry at large, Ryan, we talked about some of the obstacles that you face as well, obviously in terms of, um, you know, raising money and, uh, being a woman in the industry and uh, and and uh, regulatory, just I mean I couldn't right. I wouldn't wish this on anybody, right? It's like we just said that I wouldn't wish this on my worst enemy, right? But uh, it's uh, you know I haven't heard that one yet. But uh, you know, is there is there anything else that's been a huge obstacle, or is that pretty much uh, in it? You know, with with those things, what's the biggest obstacle you face in your business so far? Um, I would say those are really it. I would say the, you know, the regulatory framework, the expense of getting into business is really hard. And, um, and, you know, then, then just growing a plant is, is, it's a tricky thing. You know, there's a reason why it's hard to be a farmer. And a lot of that is kind of all the other issues we've talked about, but it is difficult. And um, I think ultimately, I think ultimately what this industry can grow into or can be is something that anyone has access to. And that, and I think, like I said, wouldn't it be great if we were this shining example of for other industries of how to make things more accessible. And, um, you know, for me, I think being in this, in this space, working through my, my particular uh, passion about the drug war and, and what we've done to human beings in, in the United States around a plant and I didn't just come to the table this way. It was it was an education, you know. But once I saw the light, you can't unsee it. Um, it. It really becomes about how do we flip the table for you know for for everyone, not just this industry. But wouldn't it be great if cannabis could be a shining shining light, a shining beacon? Of uh, this is how you do it, and this is how it can be done. And let, let me be really clear with you, Maynard. I don't have an issue with making money. I don't have an issue with being a profitable business. That is, that's nothing that anyone should be ashamed of. Yeah. It, it, you shouldn't be ashamed of, well, I kind of made some money in cannabis and, uh, you know, that, and then we hear it all the time. And, and in particular, that's something that comes up in, in activist circles, you know, it's like, yeah. and, and my dear, dear friend, Wanda James, she's like, she's, she's such a lovely human. Um, if you haven't interviewed her, you should. She's phenomenal. She's uh, she was the first minority dispensary owner in Colorado, and you know, just is a great, great human. Um, and and her family has been she's definitely been, she's definitely on our radar now. We just gotta you know track her down. And she's a busy woman and everything. So uh, oh my god, I'll make a call right now and make sure you talk to her. But, but my <laughs> point, but my point is is that I I remember so many times just she and I just in a corner just going oh my god this is so hard, and you know whether we're at the Capitol whether we're sitting there waiting for testimony or whatever and you know having having activists be like this you, no one should be making money on this this is not okay and i'm just like wow that seems like a real extreme on the other side and not that i'm taking away from their from their opinion or their their why they think that but i just will never forget her standing up and going i am a businesswoman yeah. i am who you you know this is what we're talking about and there's no shame in making money there's no shame in that. I want to be able to pay my mortgage and buy food for my Black family. women need to be making money from this, you know, to say that, you, that right? white men are allowed to make money, but guess what? Now black women should be, no. you know, no, it's ridiculous. You know, that's, we're talking about exactly. distribution of wealth. We're not talking about yeah. you know, doing away with all wealth. And, you know, I mean, capitalism's a, a very much under fire these days, but I think, you know, you don't throw the baby out the bathwater, especially after we've, uh, now is the time where we're actually seeing shifts you know, and yes. to now throw everything out and say, well, I mean, nobody should be making money off of it. What do you mean nobody? Should? The people who've been suffering the most, they should definitely be making money off of it. That's been the whole point. Just the white people have been able to get their hands back in there and uh, wrestle it back in their own way, you know? So, yeah. Um, yeah. It's been crazy. But, uh, yeah. yeah, I think, and I, and I think that there is some, there's some real, I think it's really fair to say that, you know, like there's no shame in being a good business owner. Yeah. And um and I think that that's I think that integrity, that's part of it. You know, it's integrity, social entrepreneurship. You know, there's a lot of the ways where you can be super successful. You know, like we, this idea that you know and what you guys have been doing, 
and not be an asshole about it, not be greedy about it and still mm -hmm. be super profitable and still do great, you know, and, yeah. and being able to, if I'm doing great, other people are doing great as well. You know, I mean, you exactly. 130 employees, all, all the boats rise, you know, exactly. and all, sh all ships rise. Exactly. Exactly. It's so, so true. Well, I, I don't know how you felt about this. So let me ask you a question. Yeah, sure. Why not? What were your thoughts when Jay-Z announced that he's getting entering the cannabis industry? Because I'll tell you exactly what my thoughts were. I mean, listen, I, I to be honest with you, Jay-Z was my first rap album that I bought, you know, uh, volume two, uh, you know, and so I have a different, I have a perspective from Jay-Z where I don't know the guy personally, right? But I've definitely heard enough about his story to know that he came for the Marcy Projects. He and came up. You know, right? he came up and he took, you know, I mean, we talk about, well, you shouldn't have done that. That's against the law. So we can say, okay, cool. He was selling crack. He was doing things, but he took something and he was an entrepreneur and he took that and then he was able to get signed and then did that. And it comes like he's completely, he continues to flip every little bit that he gets. He continues to flip it and double it, you know? So to think that, um, that there's anything wrong with that, or to think that he doesn't have our, uh, you know, people's best interest in mind, I think would be ridiculous, right? Um, in some respect. Agreed, agreed. But I'm still waiting for that. And by the way, I'm going to make sure that this is owned by, and, and I'm going to train up a whole bunch of people. And part of my proceeds are going to go to funding minorities mm. in Kansas ownership. Mm. And that's what I, that's what I'm waiting for because I've seen it. I saw it with Whoopi. I saw, it, you know, and, I, and I'm not targeting. I'm just saying, here's, a, here's an example of where people who already have means and have an opportunity to make a real change mm -hmm chose to get into it to make more money well, not not to transfer the wealth that's, that's, and the so part. that's, my pushback. that's the other part about you know talking about flipping and doubling right flipping and doubling means that you've not taken any out to help right i mean it's part of uh, you know my personal uh you know and my uh tradition that we should take at least 10 percent out and give it to charities donations of you know that we feel are worthy causes to ourselves Right. So the fact that, you know, I think a lot of people, we look at people all the way at the top and we talk about these lockdowns and how they've completely, you know, decimated so many industries right, and so many people. Meanwhile, these white rich white guys are doubling their money this year and not giving any more uh, to their workers, to taxes, to donations, to anything like that. It's it just shows it's awful. being part of the system, you know, and uh, the system in certain respects, once you get to a certain uh, level of success then becomes colorblind as long as you're still willing to play the game in that way exactly you know, so we see people that are just continuing to you know um unfortunately continue that and then they become kind of a a poster child for well don't you see they made it right but it's like thank listen, you, you know, yes like, you know it's, it's as opposed to you know where are you helping people along the way and that's been the whole thing you know it's like like you were saying that all the boats should rise so it's like you know uh how how many people are he employing and, and giving back to the communities right so instead of destructing your community for your own personal gain uh you know giving back so in a me in a meaningful way you know like in a way that that actually affects change and that's i mean i think that's that's again that's another area where i think massachusetts really tried hard to make sure that cannabis industries donated and uh -huh. that was part of your entire application and they review that by the way every renewal you have you have to be able to point to these are the these are the people that we donated to and this is why and not that they have a judgment of whether we donate donated to the humane society versus the food bank or what you know whatever that might be but it's really interesting to me that they, they, like you said, Massachusetts has made a huge effort to do the right things. We just, it's in a system that is designed not to support that. And so therein lies the challenge. And, and I'm right there with you. Look, I, I, what I would love to hear is, is Jay-Z comes up with this idea and then he's going to franchise it really cheap for a whole bunch of equity players in various various areas or something like that. And I'm not telling him how to run his business and I'm not completely judging him. I'm just saying that, unfortunately, when I've seen celebrities enter this, um, even Willie Nelson, for example, you know, who is a big farmer advocate and whatever, it's like, 
well, where, where, how is this helping? Is it seems to be Willie and it seems to be Willie's group and it's Willie's financial group that is helping, that is benefiting from this. And how is it helping farmers? How is it helping the people that you say you stand for and you're passionate about? Yeah. And I think that that lift under the hood is what the transparency is critical. Yeah. And I hope that I'm held accountable. I hope that my business is swimmingly successful and that people listen to my podcast, read things that I've, you know, read, read things that I've been interviewed about and hold my feet to the fire about it. Meg, you said you were really passionate about the drug war. Well, what'd you do to change it? Meg, you said you were really passionate about equity. Well, what'd you do to change it? And I hope that I'm able to point to the co-op kitchen and I hope I'm able to point to, well, I ran for office and this is what I'm doing. And I'm changing things, how things are happening locally. I'm changing my local police force because that's a big change if you can do that. Not that they need changing. I mean, leap, leap, leap police are great, but you know, I, I don't know. Like, I, I just feel like, we, we do a lot of celebrating of success, but we don't, I don't know that there's enough whole accountability on what you were supposed to do and what you should have done. And again, this kind of goes back to the flip side of that is like, we shouldn't be able to make any money. And I'm like, well, I, what am I working for then? I mean, I should get paid. <laughs> this is how it works. So it's a, it's a fascinating space to be. And I, I want to, I, I know, I know we have a time thing and I, I do want to just wrap up with one, one, thing that has driven me at least for the past two or three years. And I don't think it's an accident at all that this plant is coming to be such an important part of our world during this time. Yeah. I don't think that's an accident at all. And I think this plant, I really believe in the spirituality of this plant. I think it's high energy. I believe it has, it's very smart entity that has um, ability to speak to the universe in ways that we don't even understand, wow. let alone help people on a daily basis and do a lot of that great stuff on a daily stuff too. But I just feel like universally, it's an important, it's a very important entity. It's a very important part of our world. And I sit here and look at the craziness that's happening right now between pandemics and upset with human beings and false upsets with human beings who think that something's being, uh, we want our country back. Where, where the hell did it go? It's right here, you know? Um, no one has it, it's you live in it, you know? Um, and I think this notion of this plant and the power of this plant and its ability to really affect change is why it's here now. I, and you know, why didn't this happen 20 years ago? Why didn't this happen 50 years ago? Well, it didn't. Today, it's a massive topic of conversation. And I think it's supposed to be. I think it's very on purpose. And whether the plant was able to manifest that or whether the universe somehow got their arms around it and said, well, now's the time. We got to release this plant because it's going to heal the world. And what if that's true? What if that is, what if this is the beacon for healing the world? Not just of illness, but of social illness, of mental, you know, thinking of, of absolutely changing how we think about other humans and should we have a 50 you know thousand square foot home should we have a home that has 37 bedrooms in it i mean should we do those things what's what is wrong with us that we need seven houses and 27,000 cars and you know i don't understand it and I, and i think as a as our earth is struggling and things are challenged right now with resources and people need food. And we are about to see, I'm just telling you, we are, we, in my personal opinion, we're about to see social unrest like we've never seen it. And it's not from the people we're seeing at the Capitol being assholes. This is from people that are going to lose their homes and they don't have food for their children. This is where the social unrest is going to come. And I'm hoping that this plant in some way is a, is a guiding, guiding light out of that and a change for our entire society. And I'm, I'm, I'm not saying, I'm, I'm just being really clear that yeah. this is, um, it is time to change. And what are we all fighting for? This, the world we live in right now is, it's not working. So we've got to fix it. And maybe this plant's the, one of the guides, who knows? I love it. No, definitely. I mean, you know, dude, you know, you know, we're wrapping up, you know, it's, uh, we're seeing this, this place where it's in between, looks like we're between a, uh, you know, rocking a hard place, right? And we're seeing this unrest, and it seems like there's uh, there's one option that 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 uh, 
you know, there's a revolution coming, right? But, uh, you know, it seems like it's either revolution or paradigm shift, you know? And I think if it's paradigm shift, I think cannabis is definitely a big part of that. You know, if it's continuing on the same way that we've been doing the rest of our, the, you know, since uh, history of humanity, then it's obviously revolution and war and the way we've been doing it that hasn't been working anyways. You know, if it's, uh, you know, the uh, cannabis is definitely at the forefront right now, along with everything else. Um, so there's no doubt that I think uh, you're 100% on track with that. You know, so, um, you know, as, as we're closing down, as we went down, um, you know, obviously uh, very grateful to have you on. Um, you know, I ask everybody who comes on, you know, you're a very successful woman, very successful business person in the industry and otherwise, you know, how do you define success in general, right? Professionally, personally, spiritually, maybe just touch on part of that, you know, what does success look like for you? Um, I'll tell you a, a, a small story. Um, I was at the MJ Biz Conference, I want to say it was 2017. Um, and I've been involved with that entity since, it, since its inception. So we've been part of it, you know, either speaking or presenting or, you know, whatever, um, for a real long time. And I remember um, after a pretty hard year, kind of shifting from CEO of Mindful to a consultant. And kind of feeling like I wasn't super appreciated on my exit from Mindful, even though I felt like we re did really great work and built a very strong company that ultimately was purchased wow. um, by LiveWell um, this past year. So, uh -huh. you know, clearly we built something that was valuable. Uh -huh. um, and that was a real struggle too, because believe me, if you think I'm bitching about being the only woman now, even three years ago in this industry, I was very much the only woman at the table for a lot of conversations. Um, and that was even back when we had a lot more women leaders in the, in the industry. Um, at any rate, I remember standing at a, an event and I remember standing at the railing and looking across the room and going, oh my God, there are 20 people, various levels of success in this space that I'm, that I can see right now in front of me. And I know without a shadow of a doubt that if I called them on their cell phone right this moment or tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. or tomorrow night at 11.30 p.m. that I would wager 100% of them would pick up my call. Mm. And what hit me, and I, I was like literally brought to tears at that moment when it hit me that, oh my God, it's the people. So how do you judge yourself? How do I judge myself around success? It is hands down, how are the humans that are interacting with me? How are the humans that work for any entity that I'm part of? How are they treated? And how are they feeling about themselves? Mm -hmm. And if it isn't empowering, and empowering doesn't mean easy. Empowering doesn't mean, oh, we all love each other. And empowering means having the grit and courage and tools to make changes in your life, to be a better human, right? And if I can't look out in the in the wave of everybody that I interact with and think I'm leaving this place a better place and I was not successful, no matter how much money I made, no matter how much we sell a company for, no matter what our revenue is, I mean, none of that matters. And I think that's ultimately for me, what makes, what what is my driving force every day to sleep at night. Because if I'm not in, if I'm not level with that integrity on a daily basis, it creates issues for me so I don't sleep. So I know that that's my driving. I know that's the most important thing to me is that I want to make sure that my interaction with humans makes it better for them. Even if it's the smallest little, hi, how are you? Or, hey, how's it going? Or, you know, just saying hello to a stranger. Yeah. Um, that's, that's what, that's what success is to me. And, and, and I, you know, yeah, I want to be able, and let me be clear. I want to be able to pay my mortgage and I want to be able to send my daughter oh. to college. That's a given. But I would, if, if I was, no matter what amount of money was involved, I would live in the house I live in right now. I wouldn't change a thing. Oh. I would still ski in the same ski resorts. I would still, you know, there, there isn't, I know that for a fact because I've had the opportunity to experience, you know, some wealth in my life through previous relationships and whatever. But um, I just know for a fact that money does not buy happiness. Money makes life really complicated and people make, happiness and people make peace and being being able to look around my community and know that when I walk into the post office or I walk in the grocery store or if I'm walking down the street or whenever my mailman walks by that it's hey Meg and I'm able to say hey um, that is what life's about 
And that's for me, my driving force is being really solid in human interaction and relationships. That's the most important thing to me. And I really believe that if you're good at what you do and you work hard and you get up and, um, and uh, are brave and courageous and do hard things, which we do every day, um, humans do it every single day, um, that in essence creates the opportunity to kind of be at peace with what, with what you do. You know, that's, that's the thing. Money's a byproduct. Money is a byproduct of success. It is not a goal. And whenever I hear people say, my goal is to make a lot of money. I'm like, that's not a goal. That's a byproduct. Yeah. And you can do well by doing good. And that is something I will live by. And my definition of doing well is not a big number. <laughs> it just isn't. Yeah. Um, the only thing that compels me to want to make more money is to allow me to employ more people and allow me to build more things that good people can come and work in. And that's, that's what I, that's how I look at it. It's not so I can go buy a house in Hawaii. That's not what it's about. Wow. I love that. You know, it's uh, you know, I was always raised with the uh, adage, you know, money and alcohol make you more what you already are. If you're happy, it'll make you more happy. If you're not happy, it's not, it doesn't, it's not going to change you for better. You know, it definitely can change you for worse in some respects, but um, you know, I love that, you know, people and just in this conversation that we've had, you know, you have uh, such a high EQ, you know, the, I can see, you know, already the, the passion that you have for the people that you work with you know you're talking about going into a room and you know uh, who would pick up your call at 6 a.m 11 30 p.m and uh, successful people but i would wager as well that you know uh, 130 people that are working for you i've never worked for you but i'm sure they love you too and um and uh, your pleasure you know to have on and um uh, definitely uh, an amazing goal amazing thing and uh, say you're very successful in regard to that there's no doubt about that so um, as we close, you know, how can our listeners find out more about Canna Provisions, connect with you, uh, stop by your uh, store in, in, uh, in Massachusetts, but also become involved in, in all the other things that you, that you have and the, all the passion projects you have as well. Love it. So um, CannaProvisionsGroup.com is our website, also at Canna Provisions Group on Facebook and Insta. Um, and, um, my personal information is available right on LinkedIn, as well as on my, I'm, I have a, I have a public Facebook page and my contact information is right there. Um, but it's Meg at canaprovisionsgroup.com for anyone that would like to email me. Um, and, um, look, I, I have so enjoyed this and it's really been an opportunity to, to have a, a great brainstorm session with somebody who's like-minded. And I appreciate that you're passionate about it because a lot of people that I talk to only want to hear about the business and the money and the, you know, they don't want to hear about what is behind, what is the heartbeat of this business and the heartbeat of the business is the people that carry the weight of this plant so that we can all sit here now and make money on it. And if we don't honor that, then we're all going to hell. That's just fact. <laughs> That's just a fact. Thank you. Well, I appreciate that. And, you know, real recognize real. So, you know, it's, uh, I appreciate that it means a lot to me because uh, I know the, you're a real one. So, uh, and we need more people like you in the industry. There's no doubt about it. So, thank you so much. Thanks for jumping on. Good luck to you. And uh, yeah. thank you so much. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye. Thanks for listening to Dank Discussions. We are so grateful for each and every one of you. Please make sure you subscribe and leave a review. We want to continue making dank content you want to hear, so give us some feedback about the topics you want covered. Feel free to reach out to us at grow at calican.com. That's G-R-O-W at C-A-L-A-C-A-N-N dot com. And follow us on Instagram and Twitter for our latest updates.